Ryan is only 34 years old. Yes. But you know what they say, right? Black don't crack, Asian, Asian don't raisin. raisin, baby. So Ryan is going to live forever. I'm going to live to be 178 years and old. And he's going to look like he's 26 years old for yeah, that entire for span. The, for the rest of my life. Welcome to the worst Asian podcast where a couple Asian American millennials give you our shitty opinions on all things Asian. My name is Linji, and uh, I guess I'll get the elephant out of the room, or I should talk about the elephant that's not in the room. Uh, ben did not lose a lot of weight and suddenly turn into a beautiful Blasian man. Yeah. He did not. He did not. This is a very <laughs> sudden interview, so I couldn't get Ben's uh, scheduling correct. As you guys probably know, Ben got a very not easy schedule, so there was no way I could get his, him to come within like 12 hours notice or something. But I'm not alone, so you're not going to be listening to me talking to myself this entire time. I am very glad to be uh, accompanied by someone here who is also six foot two, six foot three, I should six say. Foot three. So we're just exchanging one six foot one six footer for another six footer. So I'm gonna bring him right in. Uh, he is an actor, content creator, speaker, activist. I'm together for Ryan Alexander Holmes. Ooh, what's up? I'm glad to be here. Thank you for being in my living room. Thank you for of taking course. Ben's spot. Of course, I, I just for a moment. Ben. Just for a moment. If ben. you're listening. Actually, you know, technically, if this works out well. Yeah. And if you're more punctual than Ben. Yeah. You want to replace him? <laughs> yeah, okay. pretty much. Yeah. So we're good for that. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing good. You're yeah. down in Flushing now. And you were telling me before this is your first time visiting Flushing. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the hot seat. What are your uh, initial thoughts on Flushing? Flushing was amazing. I stepped off the 7 train and I was like, so I used to live in, in China. And so I was like, whoa. Am I in China or am I in New New York? Am it I felt like Queens? China, right? It felt like China. The smells, the the people, the languages, the, the noises. Languages. You're hearing Mandarin and and I think most mostly Mandarin in Queens. In right? Flushing, it's mainly Mandarin. In yeah. the Chinatown that's in Manhattan, you hear a lot more Canto. Cantonese. Yeah. yeah. So here, when you step up, it's mainly Mandarin. Yeah, it, it's it, it felt like home. It smelled like home. Like I was like, oh, I've That's returned a to the homeland. That's a compliment. That is the a smell is a compliment. It, it's crazy because the smell is like not necessarily good, <laughs> but it's it's but homey. It's, it's it smells like home. Nostalgic. It like yeah. gives you the vibes of like being with your own people. Yeah, and, and and anybody else who doesn't know that smell, yeah, would be like, oh, you know. But I used to, to me, have I'm the like, same Ooh. argument with Ben about the smells when the H Mart in like a Chinese supermarket. Oh, like a H Mart is very immaculate. Yes, and, and like their smells and okay. they must do. They must have like purifiers near their it's seafood Korean. section. It's fancy Korean. Korean food just smell better, right? Yeah. Maybe Korean seafood also smells better. But it's a certain aesthetic of Korea. That's true too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like 99 Ranch is my jam. Is like it? I'm choosing 99 Ranch uh, over everything always. So, okay. Yeah. I was going to get to that later, but just a quick oh, question. Okay, so okay, you're, okay. you're from California, right? Yeah. We have uh, here on the East Coast, we have less, I guess, chain Chinese supermarkets, but you guys have a... 9 Air Ranch, which is like kind of like mm -hmm. as close to an H Mart equivalent as you would get over there, right? Yeah, in the Chinese community, like the Chinese version. Yeah. Is there like smaller, more local Chinese supermarkets? Or yeah. Has, uh, okay, they, there is. But are, are, yeah. are they as large and to the scale of a 9 Air Ranch? Some of them are, but I don't really go to them that often. Why? Because, like, man, 99 Ranch is like, that's, I grew up on that. Like, I would, yeah. I would go there every weekend with my grandma and my mom. Okay. Every single weekend. That's the vibe you had. That's you know like, what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. just like, it, it, is, it is like a second home to me. Fair enough. You so uh, Flushing felt that way when you first got over here, right? Flushing felt like, Flushing felt, because I used to live in uh, the Bay because I went to Berkeley undergrad. So I was in San Francisco Chinatown a lot. My brother still lives there. Okay. And so like, it reminded me of the, the compactness and like sort, sort of tall the buildings. The density, yeah. The density of it reminded me of San Francisco Chinatown. And then when you step into the establishments, you're like, oh, this is like different. This is, this is not like San Francisco Chinatown. It's, it's the exterior yes. reminds you of an old school Chinatown. Yeah. But the interior it's like, on a lot of places have been modernized. And you were saying yeah. it was like an art museum at a boba shop kind of? Yeah. Well, you get a lot of mainland Chinese chains who are fancy setting up shop. There. Very fancy. And so, but what I say it's not like Chinatown in San Francisco is because it's not for tourists at all. This is for Chinese people. Yeah. And that's well, it's when, for uh, Chinese tourists. Okay. But still for Chinese. Yes, still for yeah. Chinese. Like you go into stores and no one's speaking English at all. Nope. Yep. And there's, you'll see, uh, you'll see foreigners walk. I'm mean, not even foreigners. They're like queen, maybe Queens natives, but other parts of Queens, other New Yorkers that aren't Chinese will walk in and sort of feel lost. Yeah. 
And I'm like, this is exactly what I want. <laughs> you, you, you want the foreigners to I feel lost. I want you to feel lost You want them here. to feel lost. So you don't try to take over the space. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. But I do feel like, because I've been to San Francisco's Chinatown, and yeah. there's as much, a, as much history as that Chinatown has, yeah. I do feel like it needs like an injection of money or like something there, right? Because yeah. like it is losing a lot of stuff, and I don't. Yeah. Because the plus side about here in Flushing is that stuff gets turned over for better or worse, so that you do see like the old stuff, obviously, but there's a mm -hmm. new injection of different things. Yes. Whether you like it or not, right? Yes. It's lively. It's That's lively what I'm to say. always, and it's packed. It's so packed. You came on a Monday yeah. afternoon at one o'clock. Yeah, and I was like, damn, like I don't even know anywhere in LA that's that packed. Like. Period. You can imagine how bad it gets on a Friday night or a Saturday night yeah, you can when even, it's good weather. You're just like crowded. Can't it's crazy. Walk? Yeah. Well, that's the reason why there's four boba shops per block because it gets that crowded that you need the four boba shops. Yeah, exactly. Well, boba's in right now. It is very in. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about you and your background. Mm -hmm. For those that are not listening to... For those that are not watching on YouTube, you can't see what Ryan looks like <laughs> right now. So yeah, yeah. I guess you can have some imagination about what he looks like yeah. appearance-wise and everything. So you want to give me some background on, yeah. on who you are and what you do? Because you, yeah. call, you call yourself 100% Chinese and 100% Black, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? What exactly uh, does that mean? Where does that come from, that idea, that yeah. belief? So my mom is uh, uh, from Taiwan, grandparents from, from China, so 100% Chinese. I, 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 I'm, 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 they're... So my parents are, my mom is from, is Chinese. My dad is African-American from the South. Yeah. But I define myself as 100% both because if I don't define myself, especially in America, for myself, then society will do that for you. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you grow up in America as a minority, you realize that. Of course, yeah. Like you have to define who you are culturally or the society will push you into a category or a stereotype of the category. Yeah, box you in. And so I talk about that a lot. I also say, you know, don't be fooled by my Puerto Rican looking exterior. It's, it's not that I don't look Asian. <laughs> Yo, dude, you you just, just never seen an Asian like me before. I always say that. You take yeah. a black guy, you take a, a Chinese person, you put them together and you get a Puerto Rican kid. A Puerto Rican, <laughs> Puerto Dominican, Puerto Rican Brazilian. Kid. It's very interesting. Like, or Hawaiian, Polynesian person yeah. sometimes too, yeah? Uh, uh, or Cuban. Like when I'm walking around in uh, like certain boroughs in New York, people, they'll speak Spanish to me. I can see that. I and I'm see just that. like, oh, thank you for thinking I'm one of you. I feel welcome, but I don't know anything that you're saying. Because <laughs> they'll talk to me in Spanish for a while and be like, uh, trying to understand. I don't know any Spanish. Well, that's your fault for trying to yeah, I know. egg them on. Because right? I'm just trying. I'm like, oh, I want to fit in. You're like, okay. And, okay. Then, and, then, and then they're like, don't they like bi uh, biblioteca? Yeah. Yeah. They're like, habla espanol. And I'm like, no. So that's funny. <laughs> Because I bet you if you lived in Hawaii or like some of the Polynesian islands and everything, yeah, they would think that you would automatically see Exactly, right? In Hawaii, they kind of did. They do, right? Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Dude, if I went to like Samoa or Tonga, they would just think I was. You guys can't see this. Ryan is too skinny to be. I'm a, way too you're skinny. Way too skinny to be Polynesian. <laughs> yeah. You're way too skinny. But that's in my future. You know, when I get the beer belly and all that, like, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be like, yeah, I'm Tongan. Move, Move to Samoa. Hawaii, then you'll be there. Move to Hawaii. Hawaii, bro. So um, you said you grew up with your uh, grandparents as like your primary caretakers. My gr well, my parents and my and yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. And, but I grew up with like my Asian side, like very prevalent because they all came from Taiwan to L.A. And so I was always either at my aunt's house or at my grandparents' house. Mm. We were always eating dinner together at least once or twice a week, like huge family dinners. Oh, nice. And so I was always speaking Chinese. We were all celebrating the holiday holidays. I went to Chinese school. Like, I'm Chinese for real. Yeah, yeah. And I'm very proud of it. You're probably more Chinese than I am. <laughs> what does that mean? How good is your Mandarin? How good is your Mandarin? Uh, yeah. 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 Because I only started speaking Mandarin because I'm Winslow, right? So I speak Winslowese with my parents. Oh, okay. Well, then you speak that. You speak a different dialect. I don't speak a very useful dialect. If I'm going to like the supermarket, and that's an inside flushing joke, if I'm going to a supermarket, then it's useful, right? But if oh, I go okay. anywhere else, it's not that useful. It's, it's oh. really not. Um, so I never, I took Chinese classes as a kid. Okay, Mandarin. But Mandarin? I've only started learning Mandarin for real, for real, since I had a kid. Oh, because you want, you, want you want him to be fluent. 1,000%. Yeah, that makes 1, sense. 1,000%. I feel the same way. 1,000%. Yeah. So that's the only driving factor my entire life that has made me learn and actually retain Mandarin. Yeah. I want my son to learn it. And if I don't know shit, then I can't pass anything down to him. <laughs> yeah. So my entire thing is I've been one grade ahead of him his entire life. 
but wow. he's becoming a sponge now. So yeah. I think sometimes he's correcting my pronunciations of certain tones and stuff. Oh God, how's that feel? That feels feel absolutely horrible. It feels, it feels bad. It feels really, really bad. But I'm yeah. trying my best. So like, you know, when you don't grow up speaking the language, it is really hard. So you are very, very lucky that you grew up with family members, yeah. your grandparents, especially speaking that language to you. I realize that like every day too, because I know certain uh, Chinese Americans who, t- who tell me like, oh yeah, my parents didn't teach me Chinese on purpose. And they would say like, you're not Chinese, you're American. And so I'm not going to teach you the language. You don't need to know the culture. You need to assimilate into American culture. I think that's sad. That is sad. And there, now that you mention it, I can see, I'm trying to be in those parents' uh, shoes, right? Yeah. What's their logic? I kind of get it. They get want it. their kids just to have an easier time. Yeah. Maybe they're struggling financially or just, you know, just barely getting by. Or maybe they themselves have some tra- kind of traumatic experience. Yeah. Um, of getting used to things. Mm-hmm. So they want their kids to have an easier time. And I can see where, not that you have to agree with the logic, but I can see where the logic is coming from. I see it too, yeah. Let's not worry about your Mandarin skills. Let's just worry about your English skills right now. Yeah. I can kind of see the logic. Because it's almost logic. like, how would that help you be successful when we're in a different country? Right. So like, why would we... It's almost, it's almost like respectful of the country, like in their mind. To speak their language yeah, as opposed like, to yours? Why should you yearn... It's, it's also like, like some weird kind of level of respect and practicality, too, mm. you know? But you know, it's funny. Nowadays, they would say learning Mandarin, if you want to think like 10, exactly. 20 years down the line, like yes. that is very, very useful. It's a different time now. Yeah, business-wise, you business want to do any kind of business. Yeah. Knowing English, Mandarin, and maybe even Spanish, for some reason, right? like the most spoken languages in the world. Yeah. That's really going to get you around. Yeah. So you grew up with your parents and with your grandparents, family members speaking Chinese and everything. Um, mm. I think you talked about this a lot through your content. Was there any point where you started realizing like, hey, I'm a little bit different because, you know, I have a family that's not similar to a lot of these other families here, Mm -hmm. whether they're like full Caucasian families, full black families, full Asian Taiwanese families. Yeah. Because if you're not watching on the video, uh, right, you look like you're not very Chinese. Mm -hmm. Like at a glance, right? Like if I were to just look at you for the first time, not having met you, I would just think, oh, like... Light-skinned black man. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I'm not delusional. Like I know how the world sees me. But I, my message is like, yeah, I know how the world, how you guys, society see me, but I'm trying to tell you, like, I don't see myself the way that you see me. And I don't have to, because if I'm Chinese, if I'm Asian, I look Asian because I am Asian. It's like common sense. You just never seen sort of that representation yet. And so that's sort of my message for not just Blasians, but, but, and not just black and Chinese kids that are, but all mixed kids mm. to, to, to like, be like, look, like society's gonna treat you a certain way depending on your phenotype, but like you don't have to abide by that in order to live your life. You can live your life culturally in the way that you want. You can be proud of both your cultures or multiple cultures inside of yeah. you and and embrace them fully. You know what I mean? Mm. But to answer your question, like growing up, yeah, I'm a kid. I didn't know that. I couldn't articulate that. Right, exactly. Cause like that's your mindset now, but as a yeah. young kid, you're just trying to you're just trying to survive exactly. socially, right. emotionally, psychologically. So how is that experience when you outwardly look more black, but you're, I assume you're hanging out with more Chinese kids because you're... Chinese and white. That was my, my neighborhood. Uh, and then like 0% black. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. It was just like me and my brother, but we're both like technically half. So it's like we make one more Asian <laughs> person guys, and one black person. By your powers combined, you form one. One black and one <laughs> more Chinese person to, to the sea of Chinese people that we grew up with. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel when I was growing up. Here's the thing. The dynamic was I'm, I feel super Chinese. I feel super accepted. I feel like I can be myself in my household, right? That's my family. Yeah. Even my extended family. But then the second I step outside, it's like, I had like white kids and Asian kids that I grew up with telling me that I wasn't black. Not black enough. Yeah. And telling me that they didn't even say black enough. They're like, you're not black. And they're like, because you speak like us and you like the things that we like. You need to be, basically they're saying like, you need to be into hip hop. You Uh, need to talk with slang. You need to have like a swagger to you that you don't have. And once you get those things, then you're black. We'll accept you as black. That's the dumbest thing because it's not even another no. black kid telling you. Not that that would make it any better, mm-hmm. but it's these random Asian slash white yeah, kids telling you Yeah, the audacity. You that. Right. The audacity. But, but once again, like you go, to, you go to, the, to the source of it. Like why do they think that way? And then it's the representation in media. media that they're consuming from the news 
or from like the parts of hip hop culture or or black culture that are sort of export or not even exported, just uplifted to seem like that's all of black people, you know? Yeah. And it's usually a negative stereotype. Of course it is. Right? It's like ignorance. Like they're getting on me because I'm speaking a certain way, but it's like, why do I need to sound that way to be black? So did you have a hard time getting like close, close friends as a kid growing up? Yeah, I think so. I think so. You did have the benefit of having siblings, right? I did have siblings, but man, we went through identity crises at different times. Like oh, both really? my oldest brothers were very into skateboard culture. Yeah, yeah. So that like, they were listening to like The Who <laughs> and like, um, you know, rock Nothing band. Wrong with the Who. Yeah, and I was kind of into that, but like my thing was like the NBA and playing basketball and like getting into like street culture through that, like Steve Francis and Tracy McGrady and Kobe oh, yeah, Bryant and, and Shaq. And then also, you know, my brothers also weren't so heavy in the basketball, but were heavy in the hip hop. So like we were wearing like all those brands of the time, like Snoop Dogg's clothing brand, yeah. Vocal, which is Nelly's brand, Sean John. Oh, Sean John, bring it back. Yeah, on. like, um, uh, oh, fat farm you know what i mean but we didn't have anyone to share it with because oh, we were it was the just only, you two kids right you were the only kids we were the only like black kids in the neighborhood that's hard because as yeah. a kid usually you're choosing like a like a like a certain thing to latch on to when other kids around you are also yeah. latching on to the same thing yes so that must have been weird because you, you said there were no other uh, black kids around right so it's just the two yeah. of you but the thing is like i'm really happy that i had that experience because i ingested so many different cultures like i still listen to instinct and factory yeah they're still good. did that i still like best learn KTV those songs ever when you, you do karaoke I mean? it's all Dude, backstreet that boy. hits i just did you karaoke two days ago did you a bunch of asians from the conference i was at we sang quit playing games in my heart we sang uh backstreet boys those songs, are always bangers, songs. like must sing to us yeah um so i'm glad i experienced that um and i'm glad i was with people that experienced that it's like i did learn how to sort of navigate these cultures and then my dad was starting starting to see that like I was embracing a certain part of black culture. So he, you know, made it a point to give me parent homework on top of my homework that was that addressed like Asian American history and African American history, not from the perspective of the school system, because you know they don't tell us the ac nothing, accurate nothing. stuff. Like from African American scholars, from Asian American scholars. So I was doing homework, they're paying me for it. They were paying you to do homework? That was the incentive. Guys, 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 yeah. hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> We gotta pause this podcast for one second. We gotta pause this podcast <laughs> for one second, okay? Because I am a father. Mm. I have a six. I have a five-year-old turning six-year-old son. You better who, pay that boy. Who I have to uh, bribe to do things with Pokemon cards. But at least that's there like you a. Go. I feel like that's a tangible thing. That's just not cash money. Yeah, we got cash money, baby. Can I ask how much your dad gave you? So if it feels like a novel or from like a you know Asian or uh, black author. Yeah, it's like twenty-five cents to fifty cents per page. Hold on, guys. Pause once again. Pause once again. We, we haven't gone back to the actual podcast. <laughs> these aren't like picture books, right? So I'm, No, these are novels and yeah, they're novels. autobiographies. That's a lot of money. I've gotten worse at math in my age, but that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, actually. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Whatever. Like, I mean, yeah. Who's 200 your divided by agent four at the like time to get such a lucrative contract with your dad, <laughs> man? Like, yeah, the agent negotiate the deals with my dad. That's a good deal. 25 cents per page. Yeah, yeah. I guess that is a way of forcing a kid to learn about something that they otherwise would not learn but about. But think about how much I read so much. I at would young, read that much. At a young, that's what I'm saying. At a young age, like it worked. And I think the thing that it instilled in me too was a love for learning. And that was the point. Oh, yeah. My dad and my mom tell me that like we we're trying to instill a love for learning. They never gave me a break. Like, what do you mean? Like, it was school during the week. Then it was Chinese school on the weekend. Oh. And then in the summer, it was always summer, summer school. school. Always summer school. And then on spring breaks, usually they'd send me to like a leadership conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In like New York. Oh, for real? Or, or like Atlanta. Oh, that's good. You know what I mean? And Besides so, that part of it, I had like the same experience too. Summer, yeah. summer wasn't for playing. Summer was for, no. for learning the shit from the, from the next grade so that you yes. could get ahead. That's and all, then that's you all throw it was. sports into that because I was really good at track. So we were traveling the, like, the nation doing different track meets. Oh, wow. And so, and so like, yeah, I had like a fully fledged out sort of childhood. It seems like a good balance. Some, some people yeah. might still say that's kind of crazy. Yeah. But it's not like you were your head in the book the entire time. Like you said, you're yes. out doing track. You were doing... And they like, weren't forcing me to do it. 
Are you sure they would? I mean, for for twenty five cents a page, I wouldn't be forcing no, no, no. you. They might have been manipulating it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they weren't like get your ass. In. Yeah, they were like, okay, you want some money? You want to pay for stuff? Like, read this. This book. is how you're gonna make some money. Read these yeah. two books. Then you got your money for the summer. I read these four books. You that's know? good. That's good. And so I was always reading. And then after a while, it just became like second nature to me. I just want to read. Yeah. And I want to find the subjects that I care about. And something that was fun for me too. Uh, was like going to school and knowing more about the te- knowing more about the subjects than the teachers did. Than the teachers did, and then them getting mad at me, and then them saying I'm disrespectful, and then my dad coming to the principal's office. Oh, did that like, actually happen? Yeah, and being like, "No, leave my kid alone." Like he actually is not being disrespectful. It's just like he knows certain things that these teachers don't know, and they're mad about it. Like so, back off, my kid. And if I didn't have parents that were like that, mm. I could see the system sort of making me think lesser of myself. That's true. But like we got what we wanted out of the school systems because they were traditional and they were, we were kind of in a conservative environment. Okay. Like if I didn't have my parents to protect me, another thing dude is they, they tried to put me and my brother in special ed classes. As soon as (laughs) we got to that school district, they labeled me slow. um, And they labeled my brother disruptive. Huh. And so they're like, how would they do that when you just got to the school? Or is it like a from a well, they would do, report from your past? No, it was just a report after like weeks of being there. Oh, okay, okay. So after a you couple of weeks, I mean? they, they said you switch. And, and my dad's like, no, nah, we're not doing that. Oh, it was you voluntary. I mean? Huh? What do you mean? It was voluntary. Like they were asking you. Oh, you no. Couldn't, it bro. was voluntary, but they still took us out of class and placed that. And the only way my parents found out was like, I was like, yeah, I'm in a special class. You're like special class. And it's really easy. <laughs> and I, I think I'm a genius. And so they came to school and they're like, what is the special class? Yeah. It's like, oh no, this is a special it's class. Special, special class. And yeah. they're like, don't, you're not doing this to my kid. Uh, you know? That's, that's ridiculous that they wouldn't tell the parents about it. That's the one point that I can't get across because if my kid was placed in a random class yes. and they didn't inform me, the parent, I'd be like, what the fuck is going on here, right? Exactly. And I, I think my dad, I don't know, I really had to talk to them about this because... I don't know what went behind, went down behind closed doors, but like I'm sure my dad and my mom probably threatened to like go to the LA Times or something. Yeah, you know what I mean because that's a serious thing to do. Yeah, like so. Long story short, that they did that. We, me and my brother, get all A's. Okay, you know what I mean, and <laughs> get everything class. that we need out of that system because we definitely had teachers who definitely were prejudiced. Mm. Was like this it, high school or this is elementary school oh this is elementary this is school just elementary school wow and then middle school too we went to a different high school we didn't stay in that school district high school we went to like a private high school but like you know i always say like oh what does safe mean because that environment for us wasn't safe mm. even with the police there like they would sort of they bullied me in the dare program yeah and they would single you know my my brothers out when we were just in the neighborhood skateboarding or playing you guys basketball. Because yeah. we're different. Because you own your kids that yeah. look that way. So, so I'm like, was it safe? I don't know. Like, if my parents didn't have that talk with me about like, hey, Ryan, Ryan you guys are different. Yeah. Like, and you need to understand that in order to be so that you are safe. And I'm like, what do you mean? And that was a young age. That was like- It's hard to tell a kid that they're Eight years yeah. old. And so you're having to process that at such a young age and then still be instilled with the sense of pride in who you are. Like, I, I give my parents a lot of credit for that. From what you're telling me and what I've seen, I think you really did have a very supportive structure around yeah, you. The yeah. The fact that you had siblings also made it a little bit easier because you're not going home by yourself, having to deal with the same stuff by yourself. I yeah. think like, you know, God bless your parents and your family. They, they really give you a uh, like a good foundation so that you can grow up mentally healthy with your situation yeah i can't imagine where if you're like the only kid if you're like a only child and your parents were just busy doing their own thing oh my god not that that they're not supportive but that that they just don't have the time to like help you along that it would have been a much harder transition for you it was a very curated childhood it was it was it was and i realized that and you know both my older brothers have kids i don't have kids yet but or that you know of or that i know of um (laughs) And, but we talked to each other like not they, they they really managed almost like our childhood as if it was like an MBA career mm. or like an acting career you know what I mean like like there are managers they're like okay they're gonna do this this year and then oh we gotta think about high school okay what are they doing every summer okay there's the leadership conference 
that takes time. It does. It takes a lot energy. of time. And they're picking me up to go to football practice, basketball practice in the, in the AAU leagues, and then track practice. And they're going to, my dad was my coach for a lot of my athletic stuff. Nice. So he's going to, going to coach me, not only pick me up, you know? And so I'm like, oh, okay. That's, that's why I am the man that I am today. I am the human that I am today because I had such involved parents. Very, you know? very good words. And guys, remember, it's May right now. So happy AAPI month to you. Also, yeah. go find your mom this month. You know, go give them a hug. Go find your dad next month. Give them a hug. Because from like what we're talking about right now, it takes a village just to raise one or two or three yeah. kids in your situation, right? Yeah. So was there any point when you were younger that you realized like that you started, I guess, embracing more of your Asian side? I like to say I, I came out as Asian four years ago. Oh, so you came out the Asian closet four years ago. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. like, like, you know, the way that I look is like, yeah. people don't think that I'm Asian right off the bat. And so I think also the way that I grew up, I sort of like didn't embrace it that much because I'm like, if the Even world- Even with your uh, grandma around? Outside, outside of my household. Okay, outside. Outside of my household. And then a sort of when uh, COVID happened. Yeah. You know, I'm an actor. I audition. I do projects. There was nothing happening. No audition. Of course. No projects. And you're stuck at home. Because you can't leave. They're telling you, don't stay at home. I don't leave. Stay at home. And so I didn't have any creative outlets. I didn't have social media at the time at all. I had left social media. Oh, really? To, like, focus on acting. Yeah, guys. Uh, Ryan is uh, looks very young for those that are watching and seeing his content. So sometimes people think, like, maybe it's another Gen Z kid doing the whole social yeah, media yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ryan is not much younger than I am. I'm a millennial, baby. You guys know that I'm 37, but uh, Ryan is only 34 years old. Yes. But you know what they say, right? Black don't crack, Asian, Asian don't raisin. raisin, baby. So Ryan is going to live forever. I'm going to live to be 178 years and old. And he's going to look like he's 26 years old for yeah, that entire for span. The, for the rest of my life. For that entire span. For the rest of my life, baby. So you didn't have social media at that time, right? I didn't have social media. And so I, um, I came back to social media now with a purpose. Because before I was using social media, I'll be honest, I was like a model. And so I was just posting like that makes sense though like half naked pictures <laughs> that makes sense. And then I was like, oh, this is doing this is completely damaging my sense of self and my mental health. Let me get off this, recalibrate. And it was actually a great time being off because then I started focusing on things that like mattered more to me. So when I came back, I was like, let me come back with purpose. And what gave me purpose was actually like the trauma of BLM and Stop Asian Hate. Yep. And then you know those. Those things are happening kind of at the same time. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine from your perspective. Yeah. It must have been really... Exactly. And then they started beefing with each other. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, in the, in the, narr in the media narratives were kind of All like the fueling that. And so I was like, you know what? I need... To First of all, I was calling my brother all the time. The brother, Can I talk about this? My brother with two kids. Okay. And a wife. And a full-time job. And he was like, okay, Ryan, like, I <laughs> have a, I have a job and kids and a wife. Like... Don't you want to tell somebody else about this? <laughs> nice way of saying uh, stop yeah. calling me. <laughs> and so and so he was like, just go back on social media maybe or write like a start writing. And so I I came back to social media. I started making like short videos just talking about these things. Yeah. But it, with me, it's always there's always levity. There's always humor. There's always irony at the end end of the sort of like moral of the story. Yeah. It's never too heavy. You know what I mean? I talk about heavy project. Pop, problems but with levity and sort of like a hopeful ending of course so i started doing that in my first post it was a post on subtle asian traits and it was like kind of it was addressing the anti-blackness in the asian community and saying how i felt it that was my first experiences of racism were from my own community but i don't have the benefit of like um hating that entire community because i am still a part of it yeah so i can't hate like when a lot of people do that aren't a part of both and and sort of calling out that anti-blackness and also ending it saying like if you are mad and upset by this and you're asian just know that you're contributing to stop asian hate you're, you're contributing to asian hate because you're hating on a fellow asian and so like i thought that i would be like it would be like 95 percent hate people just hating on me saying shut up like that was what was in my mind but like it was the opposite it went viral. Ninety, I want to say like ninety nine percent of people supported it. That's that's surprising. Yeah, that's, right. That's very surprising. I'm not gonna lie. Yo, we love you. You're a part of our community. I'm so glad that you spoke up about this because, like, I feel kind of ill when I hear 
other Asians say racist things or I see the narrative be turned into a black and first Asian black thing. Asian kind of thing, yeah. Obviously, like I said 99%, but there was 1% of people who were Of course, like, of course. There's always a shut couple up trolls monkey there, yeah. and shut up, eat your banana. Like, and to me, I was like, oh, wow, though, but 99% support? It changed my viewpoint of what the Asian community actually felt. That's when the Asian closet door creaked yeah, open a little bit. Yeah, it creaked open and I came out the closet. <laughs> came out the back the closet. Asian closet. And I was like, ah, oh, let me like start talking more about this. And, and maybe there is like a, a uh, not just an audience, but maybe there is like a, platform for, a platform for me to speak about this because this is very near and dear to my heart because like I said, I'm Asian for real. You know, it's funny. It's not like you suddenly decided to learn Chinese four years ago or like yeah. to do these Asian Chinese things four years ago. You've always been doing that your entire life, yeah. but you just never outwardly spoke with it, uh, spoke about it yeah. outside of your core nexus of uh, exactly. family and friends, right? Yeah. Okay. And in my mind, I thought that no one cared. Like, why would anyone care? And that's, it, what's crazy to me is the fact that like, you know, I'm speaking at conferences and I, I and- Yeah, because you have seen that, because you're in New York right now, because you just spoke at TAF. I just spoke at, spoke at TAF and, and I think what people, first of all, people are confused, right? Because I look, to them, I don't look Chinese. I don't look like I would- be able to speak the language or know so many idiosyncrasies or you know these these very very fine-tuned things about chinese and asian culture um but also like i don't come at any issues with aggressiveness or animosity i'm always considering the source yeah there's always levity there's always humor to be always found. humor humor is the best there's always humor to be found avenue that i've learned to like get a real serious point of yes right? Not everyone's going to take you, whether you're speaking calmly and seriously and yeah. openly about something, but yeah. humor is one thing that can penetrate almost any barrier that That's someone puts saying. up. Because no one really wants to hear a lecture either. No one does, right? It's boring. It is, it is. Yeah. But you can, if you can get the similar point across through like a much more acceptable medium, like humor, comedy, something yeah. like that, right? Or just with a tone of exactly. humor, then I think that always works so much better. You know, something that, that, that took a, a huge burden off my shoulder was just like, I don't have to like do that. I don't have to lecture or talk about deep things and literally just show people. I could just show my people, my family yeah, and how we joke and laugh, and get along, and experience both cultures so easily. So there's such a synchronicity in our family and people are surprised by that. Yeah. And I'm surprised that people are surprised by that. Do that, people yeah. expect your family just to be like a, conflicted cultural mess or something just because it's so different i think they just don't imagine the fact that they, we could get along because some people will see my family interacting and they'll be like how do you guys get along so well i'm just like what do you mean family how are you not supposed to yeah. love each other yeah it's you, dad mom it's siblings it's all that because stuff in right? their mind they've been so conditioned to see like black people not getting along with asian right and so uh, one of my messages too is just like yo is that how you really feel or how you can be being conditioned to think that way you know, because mm. that's a lot. Like a lot of people are subconsciously wired to think like there's nothing that I can agree with with that black person or yeah. that Asian person or that Hispanic person or that foreigner because we're different and they all think this way because because you're conditioned by stereotypes. Of course, yeah. And I think something that I've learned by embracing myself fully, both my cultures, and understanding that they were we're not so different, is that it's brought me closer to my own humanity and my own core values as a human that I can sort of look at anybody and not judge them for like what I think they are or what I yeah. think their culture means about them. I'm like, no, let me talk to this person as a human. Yeah. You know he's still I mean? a person at the end of the day, right? And I think that's sort of the lesson for everybody. You know, love your culture, but don't think it makes you separate from people and their humanity. Right. You can be proud of who you are and not look down on other people or think you're so different that you can't interact. Yeah. And even if you have differences, those, those, Differences don't inherently make you or that other person worse or better or anything like that, yeah, right? Yeah, We're all just human beings like here just trying to get by. And oh, man. At the end of the day, most of these petty things that we fight about don't make a difference. At all. Like people that are on their uh, deathbeds always say that they regret spending so much time or mental space worrying about all these dumb things, right? Yes. Others' opinions. Right? Yeah. Like who gives a shit what other people think about you? Like... The, old, the older you get, the more you realize like there's just a core group of people that really matter and their opinions matter. Yeah. Everyone else's is just whatever, right? Not that yeah. you choose to actively not care about those other opinions, but you don't take them with so much weight as, as compared to like your family and your friend and stuff like that. That's 
hundred thousand percent. Yeah. It's just, there's so much weight lift out of, off your shoulders when you're like, I don't really care about the negative opinions or the prejudiced opinions of others. What, what does that have to do with me? And then you also realize like the part of you that does care is your ego. It is. Yeah. yeah. Cause you're trying to please somebody else. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that is kind of the hard thing. I think as like a side pivot about social media, cause you do a lot of content on social media Yeah, where you are putting yourself out there and maybe you don't care about what you're saying, but sometimes you get, you attract or you, there's a lot of negative comments that come your way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, have you learned to deal with that in any mm -hmm. constructive way? Because you're probably getting negative comments about your Asianness, about your blackness. You know, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of people throwing crap at you. Yeah, usually those profiles. I mean, it's multi-layered. Usually those profiles are anonymous. They are right. Yeah, they're never. It's like almost never someone's face. And so I'm like, okay, like that. That's that, first of all, that is cowardly. Very. And then I also consider the source. I'm like. You're probably a kid or even an adult or someone that's been conditioned to think that way. And you're not even, I'm not even talking to you. I'm talking to the ideology that has hijacked you. So well, I'm not going to try to convince that person. You know, one of my posts landed on like KKK Instagram, like where it was just like getting, I've never gotten that much hate or been called the N word or, or been called monkey that many times. Wow. To the point where I was like, I can't read my comments. Yeah. yeah. Or I have to turn comments off on this post. Because this isn't helping me, it's not helping anybody, and it's just not worth it. Like, I post almost every day, like, I'll post another thing. Like, it's fine. Yeah. But you can't control that. So it's best to not engage. What the it's trolls? It's best not to engage and just to continue to going your course. Because there's traps that certain creators fall into. I've fallen into it too. It's like, you start making content from the hate. Oh, as a reaction to as the hate. As a reaction to the hate. And then your whole channel can turn into that for a while. What I realized when I would do that, even if I was clapping back and making it funny, was that the hate would keep coming. Yeah. And that I would, and that I was, since I was responding from hate, there was hate within me. There was revenge that I wanted within me. And I just didn't feel good. Uh, it's like a vicious cycle. Like hate begets hate begets hate. And it keeps and going and going. centering like the pride and the joy. You're centering clapping back from in anger to the hate. You know? so. How I address is like turn off comments, just not reading my comments, and I still post every day. You know what I mean? It's mostly positive. Like yeah, by because far. your message is always going to be the same, right? But not yeah. everyone needs to listen to that message or is going to agree with that, right? There's a few small percentage yeah. that's going to, you know, troll in the comments. But aside from that, it should be fine, right? That shouldn't like stop you from doing that. Yeah. You do learn to grow thick skin being on the internet. Very, very thick skin. Yeah. I can't imagine how thick your skin has been i i and considering how skinny you are you're probably like <laughs> my real actual skin yeah. is very thin um but i i question the, the idea of thick skin too though because like sometimes it's repression not actually thick skin you know what i mean oh you mean like you're suppressing your emotions you're as suppressing opposed to your emotions and repressing your emotions as opposed to actually dealing with them and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up sometimes you're just not sharing how you actually feel mm. and you're not there's no outlet for it and like you explode so it's okay to react to the racism i'm not saying that i'm just saying like you still have to deal with it in your own way like heal heal from it you're it saying comes. not to ignore it but to deal with it whether it's privately you can ignore it if you just never see it but like if you see it it's coming in it is, it is and you yeah. need a filtration system like you need to do self-work in order for that to hit you and it not to like do things there's a lot of social media stars who have like mental problems because they don't have a system to deal with like all that that's coming in. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's tough to put yourself out there. It, it really is. Especially if you have a message can, that can attract a lot of hate. Yeah. It is really tough to put yourself out there so consistently, which is why yeah. extra props to you for constantly being like, appreciate a, it. like a positive light. Um, I follow your social media specifically for your grandma, by the way, not for you. Yeah. For your that's grandma. what everyone says. Just your grandma. I get it. She's a star. Once she leaves, she's the true star. I'm going to unfollow you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so just be ready. Okay. We need more grandma content. <laughs> At least like once a week or once every couple of weeks. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm going to follow you. So many people say that. They're like, oh, I love your grandma. I'm like, she's the star, isn't she? She is the star. It's not me. You don't follow. <laughs> you don't follow me for me. You follow me for her. I get What it. is your relationship with, uh, with, she's Taiwanese or from mainland China? She's uh, from mainland. She's from Shanghai. Yeah. How close is your bond with her? We're very close. I mean, she like raised me, you know? I mean, my, my parents raised me, obviously, but like she was always there. Picking my butter. Same butters. household? 
wipe my booty. Nah, but we all lived in the same area. Okay, okay. So I was always there, and my parents would drop me off there all the time as a kid. I spent a lot of time babysitting, right? Time. Yeah, yeah. So we're really close, and she doesn't speak any English. So zero like, English? Like I speak to her in Chinese. Oh, that's good. See, when yeah. someone has zero English, they can't even like default to Chinglish. She speaks more English than she want than she like actually does. You know what I mean? But like, she likes speaking to you. But she likes Chinese. speaking to me in Chinese, and she kind of refuses to speak English, even though she can speak. She's been here for so long. Because as a as a parent, sometimes when you like open that door, then your kid yeah. takes it and they just start speaking all yeah. all English. Because my son right now, he's at the age where he speaks English with his classmates, school mm-hmm. obviously, right? And then at home, sometimes when there's like a noun that I don't know, I'll throw in some English as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but if I default to all English, he's like, oh, we're going all English okay, today. Easy. We're going all English today, right? <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. Jiang Zhongwen, Jiang Zhongwen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, I can't see that though. But yeah. no English from her, just all, all yeah. um, Chinese. That's it, good. That's it's good. interesting because my Chinese will ebb and flow. What do you mean? Like, like when I was in school and I was in Chinese school as a kid, I spoke way, uh, like more fluently. And then it starts to die out. And then I study Chinese in college. Then it comes back. And then I study abroad in China. And then it's like damn near fluent. And I come back and I'm having conversations with my grandma. And I'm like, wow, I understand yep. everything you're saying. And you're Detailed talking conversation. And you're talking shit about family members. <laughs> you're talking deep level shit about family members. And I'm just dying because I'm like, oh, I get it. I get why you certain family members are in their feelings when, when you talk to them. It's one of those things where yeah. if you don't use it you're really gonna lose it yeah and then and then you know it's been a minute since i've been in china and you know i see my grandma you know once or twice a week maybe Mm -hmm. uh and so like it starts to dissipate and then i'll Uh, watch like a bunch of chinese dramas and and listen to chinese music and sing it and watch chinese cartoons and i'll come back you know what i mean because i'm not immersed in it on a day-to-day basis so your friend circle isn't really speaking chinese we're not speaking chinese all, right? we're speaking english even if they're chinese even if they're not- chinese chinese american we're speaking english okay okay yeah. how long were you in china for i was there for five months in shanghai that's a long time yeah Budan oh no yeah. idea where that is though but- that's in shanghai and it's like the harvard harvard of uh china one of them okay there's like harvard there's like a harvard yale and they're in right it's Budan dashway and then there's one in beijing i forgot what it's called oh huh. and how was your experience there how was it when you first got it there? It was, I mean, I just partied all the time. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to lie, dude. And I signed with a modeling uh, agency out there. So I was yeah. like, modeling, going to clubs, partying, still went to school. But I didn't really, honestly, I didn't make any friends at the university. Oh, that sucks. Because in my mind, I was like, these are all like nerds, which they were. Because it's, come on, it's like the hard. Oh, so it's like two separate groups of people that you're hanging out with. That's like what I'm in saying. school, the ones you had to for. And then like the club people who are, I still had like mainland Chinese people that I hung out with. I also, i was in track my mom's friend that she i think she grew up with was an olympic track coach at the shanghai sports academy Mm. so i was training with those guys athletic like in track wow and it's funny i was so i'm I'm a collegiate athlete d1 i was a junior olympic champion all american in high school so when i got there i was like you got this i got this like these (laughs) chinese kids i'm gonna smoke them (laughs) and i get there and i'm like oh my god faster than you we were going neck and neck oh really and yeah, and I was like, I just expected this to be easy. Easy, yeah, like a. And it actually made me better that I, because I was battling with injuries all up until that point. Like, you know, I got, I herniated disc in my spine and tore my hamstring my sophomore year. And this is my super senior year. This is like the beginning of my fifth year. And so, like, I was like, oh, I'm just going to take it easy and beat these little Chinese kids. <laughs> but they like actually made me better. The problem probably was you were partying the night before with all those other models. So you're probably like half full of alcohol. And then Maybe. the following morning, you know, that kind of slows you down. Yeah, yeah. As but... a person that has had a couple hangovers, I, I can tell you, I don't run as fast when I'm like completely hungover that following morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have but you gone back since though? For any like... I haven't gone back to China since, but I've been to Taiwan. Yeah. Okay, okay. I do want to go back to China. I do want to go back to Shanghai. Do you have much family there? I have like Close very, family? very distant relatives on my grandma's side that live in Shanghai. I haven't met them. Oh, so it's not someone that you would stay with? Yeah, no, no, because I'd never met them. Yeah, but I would, I would love to meet them eventually, mm. but we'll see if that happens. I mean, you should get out there. Should. Worst case, it's, it's great for content, right? That's true. Right? It's Can true. you like, tell your account to mark it off as like, an expense or something? I probably could like, write it off as like, a business expense. Yeah, something. Yeah. Well, I'm not yeah. sure what the exchange rate is, but 
And who knows, you, you might be able to do something reasonable. I'm sure it's mm-hmm. cheaper for you to go on a month-long vacation in Taiwan than it is to stay in LA somewhere, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you might as well just do that. You might as well just do that. I want to go back. Yeah, I think I want to live in Taiwan and like, let the culture and the language soak back in. You know? That would be good for you. That would be good for yeah. you, too. Okay, um, I've got a couple questions. I posted on social media a uh, very salacious picture of you and I uh, tagged some pictures. That picture you used, I was like, okay, he's big going brain. for the algorithm. Big brain, big yeah. brain. Okay, okay. <laughs> let me pull that up. I think we answered some of them. I, I was skimming before, but I wrote down a few over here. Uh, just give me a second yeah, while I grab yeah, yeah, all these yeah. notes. That's all right, so here funny. we go. Here we go. You know, you need to have, you have so many pictures out there, right? You use the most tantalus, <laughs> tantalizing one. Plus where I placed the question box kind of like gave the illusion that, that, that I you was were like butt naked. butt naked the entire time. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. This question, whatever you ask, have you spent any time in China or Taiwan? Yeah. Um, do you have any like food or dishes that your grandma or your mom or whoever makes at home that you're really yes. nostalgic for? So I guess like what are some of your favorite things to eat when you go back home with your family? It's my grandma's ginger crab, which, you know, I need to make. I need to learn how to make that. So that I can carry on the tradition because it's funny because like that dish is like crack to me. Is it? And she like literally makes it now. She doesn't cook as often as she used to, but she will literally just make it for me because not everyone loves it as much as me. And there will be like a pile of crab. That's good for you though. Like bone, like, like shells. And it'll all just be me. Uh. And then everybody else will be eating that, mostly everything else. And I'll be like, just give me all the crab. Is that something yeah. that you really like just because you had it? For so long from her back then or is it just like a taste profile that you like i think like it's the ginger? both i think it's both because yeah. not not everyone loves ginger yeah even though it is so predominant in asian chinese cooking right yeah but it's not sort of like it's not leading with the ginger it's like a brown sauce brown sweet um savory sauce that she makes she adds the ginger in there yeah so like when i i guess when i say ginger crab people probably think that ginger is the foremost flavor it's right. not it's mixed with other things and it's and it's sort of uh, the viscosity. It's 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 more of a liquid sauce than it is sort of like a dry. So it's a whole crab, right? It's not people are yes, whole crab. Yeah, whole crab. She, whole crabs is where she you have murders to eat. the crabs right in front of us, <laughs> and she fuck yeah. Makes whole crabs it. are where you have to go. Yeah, the amount of work it takes is something that I'm not. That's what I'm saying. That it's I don't that. like it's the patience. To have. I don't like. I don't have patience. Also, you for have that. to murder crabs. You have to buy them alive. You have to, and you because have to, you know about that, right? Like about the bacteria that exactly. forms yeah, yeah yeah if you don't buy them alive and Same cook them right there lobster also like you have yeah. to make sure they're alive and they're and, and they're you waving to goodbye to you murder them yes but yes. whole shell whole shell crabs are something that unless it's like a dungeness crab which is much more meaty yeah like if you have something small like a uh, blue something crab yeah it's the blue crab yeah that one is something that I'm so lazy that I don't want to like take all the time to work for theoretically such a you small mean. i know exactly what more you mean. so of meat i know you want the king crabs with the big ass I legs do. oh yeah long time listeners of the podcast know that the only crab i really love are, are king crabs right yes king crabs are horrendously expensive mm. but they're expensive for a reason though yeah because the you get more ratio meat. You get so much more meat do you just like have them cold and dip them in butter or do you like them so when you have king crab here at most cantonese places you yeah. can cook it three ways right okay because there's enough of the crab that they can cook three ways um, so the legs and the body can be made into two, two separate dishes. Mm-hmm. So each half of the of the king crab is made into two separate dishes. And then the head, depending on how much nice umami kind of like yeah. innards there are, yeah. you can do like like a steamed egg with that or like a fried in rice with in the head. Just the head. Okay. But the body can, made, can be made two separate ways. My favorite way is like when they stir fry with salted egg yolk. Okay. So it's like crispy and it's got the salted egg yolk taste on it. And then yeah. the other half is like in this vermicelli kind of noodle sauce or like ginger and garlic and everything so like that's uh not really a soup but it's just like it has it's much more saucy yeah but king crab is very very expensive it's not something that you're having it's yeah. not something that you're going to your grandma's house and she's no, getting for you, you right can't do that unless yeah. grandma's from singapore and she's crazy rich you know she's not doing that for you though yeah yeah, yeah is there yeah. any other uh things that you love having with your family i mean dude we have staple restaurants that have been in the community in the San Gabriel Valley for like decades. Yeah. And, you know, my grandpa passed when I was in high school. His favorite restaurant is Jirong. It's Peking Duck. We typically go there like, you know, once every couple months. Okay. That's like a family celebratory meal like or something. Fa- yeah. Yeah. And, and nostalgia based. And, you know, it was grandpa's favorite restaurant. So we always remember him. That's good. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chinese meals are always the best because this whole family banquet style. I think yeah. All cultures that do this banquet style thing, you're doing it correct. 
Yes. When you get like individual things. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's so kind of, weird. It's weird. Because you can't try different things. Yeah. Right? Like, have you seen that video of those like the European white, dude. white yeah. dudes? And then like <laughs> one dude has this a fish, just a boiled whole fish, fish. Whole fish. Whole fish eating it by himself. I'm just like, dude, what are you doing? Or just fried rice by itself. By itself. I know you can't. I'm like, dude, you have to share. That's, That's what... the beauty of Chinese banquet style eating. And I guess dim sum also where you can have like yeah. so many various things and you're sharing. Yeah. Like, it's it's basically in large tapas, right? When you go to tapas with friends at a bar, it's, you're doing the same thing too. You're trying out like small little dishes. Yeah, and it, and it, and it sort of like makes you, uh, it brings camaraderie yes. without having to like say anything. Right. It just, it's in the doing of it. Because if you're eating your whole fish and it's like yeah. nice and delicious, but your friend across the table is not eating that, he's having like his bowl of snails or something by yeah, himself. Yeah, by himself. By himself. It's like, <laughs> you can't really tell him how yeah. good your fish is. I, yeah, but like with that's true. That kind of eating, you can like, literally just take a piece of it and you're all sharing the same experience and trying like like i have this video that went viral yeah where it was like my whole my extended family so we got like japanese hispanic uh portuguese um austrian uh american white american black american from the south you know black from la all from the same chinese all at the same table it's a big ass table by the way it's a big ass there's like (laughs) 15 people that's at the a big table. ass table and i just went around like and showed All everybody the lazy susan kind of yeah thing? and then i was sitting next to my grandma and people were like oh my god homie has the whole un or <laughs> this is like three in one shampoo i'm you like, see, like yeah that is the future that is basically the future right where yeah. you have all these different extended families from different parts of the world different colors different heights different everything yeah. everyone's together but you're sharing a meal maybe not everyone likes that meal yes. right? but yes. you're sharing it together and like that's what's cool that, my auntie that's and uncle up. From the south, we're like, we ain't eating those chicken feet. Oh, uh, and that's funny to me. It's funny to me, but I and I get it. But I'm like, but you gonna eat pig, pickled pig feet though? Same exact shit. It's like, how is this disgusting? But like, that's not disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> they're on the same farm. We're on the same pe- We're on the same team. Yeah, just eat this damn chicken feet. You good, know what good. I mean? Uh, so yeah. you do get a chance to go back to your family often, right? Often, yeah. Uh, okay, let's see where we are with these, some of these questions. Uh, surprisingly, no one actually sarcastically asked for your uh, cell phone number. Nice. Yeah. That's good. Let's see. Um, the demographic is changing. Does race play a factor when you're dating? And I guess mm. you can take this in whatever direction you want. Like, I get it. Yeah. Do you attract more Asian people? Do you attract more Black people or vice versa? Like, uh, I mean, I, don't, I can't really control what I attract, but I do think when I look at what is attracted to me, that it's like kind of everything. And I think that's because I, I give off this energy of just like loving myself and sort of loving everybody for who they are. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's very much culture, not color. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like if you are intolerant of Chinese culture or black culture, like how could I be with you? That's true. Do You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter even if you are black or if you are Chinese or Asian, like if you find any of my cultures sort of like off putting or weird or, or weird or disgusting to you, then like goodbye. You know what I'm saying? I do think it is better nowadays because for all the negatives that is social media and the internet, it does give people more exposure to all different kinds of cultures. Yeah. So, like maybe in a time two, two decades ago when you would only see unique ethnic things once every year or when you go when you go visit a country or like at a yeah. like a, a cultural festival or something i yeah. think like the beauty of social media is it does expose people that would otherwise not be exposed to all branches of people that's true I, so the yeah. same thing can like extend to dating yes. as well right so like yeah. now you're not so um thrown for a loop when someone mentions like a culture and a yeah thing that you've never seen before and you're like oh yeah i saw something about that right so you can connect in some way yeah i will say that i'm attracted to women that have a love and pride for whatever their culture is yes and they want to share that and they're not ashamed about it like i also dated a girl who's like oh my god if we have to do one more chinese thing i'm gonna lose my mind i'm like okay bye forever, <laughs> forever. yeah bye forever you know uh, uh, that's kind of tough yeah but you know it is what it is yeah okay um what else do i have over <laughs> here i guess what they mean is was there the worst way that someone's asked you what you are oh uh like what is the right way to ask what you are dude any way is fine it's just the intention to me it's the intention okay but can you tell intention when they're asking though sometimes right away like what if it's like what are you like if it's like that i'm like why are you saying it like that tonally you can you know tell. what i mean i get why certain people would be would be upset when 
people say, what are you? Human. Yeah, yeah. But for me, I'm like, if you ask me what I am, and I'll just be like, I'll tell you, I'm black and Chinese. I'm super laid back about that. Like, yeah. I used to get that sometimes too. Yeah. And not even trying to be compassionate for the other person, but it just genuinely didn't really bother me because I me. knew what yeah. they meant. Unless they said it was with the absolute snarkiest yeah. tone or something, except for the extremes, everything else in the middle, I'm like, I know what you mean. I it doesn't matter like how you're asking. I know what you're asking. I think what I think it's different maybe for women too, because they're being maybe exoticized and fetishized when oh, when that when the, yeah. it's like where are you from or what are you? It's like and that so, guy's being creepy interested. Yeah. But even then I still think it's intention too. You had to do that on a case by case basis. Cause it's funny to me, it's like I'm black and Chinese. Yeah. And I remember at the time, I remember it was like a trend to be mad about the question, where are you from or what are yeah. you? Yeah. And I would ask that to somebody who doesn't know that I'm Asian and they would get mad. And I'd be like, no, okay, hold on. Let me tell you my background. Right. I'm Chinese and black. And they're like, no, you're not. And I'm like, oh, so now you're doing the thing. Now you're doing it to me. So see how this works? It's confusing as yeah. hell. I mean, so you just don't, you should never leave with, lead with thinking that the person has a bad intention when they don't. You never, should always, never. I feel like, ask for clarification first and then confirm this guy is fetishizing. This guy is creepy. You know what I mean? It is definitely tougher if you're a woman and you're being asked yeah. something like that. And I get it. Especially if it's like the first couple questions that they're asking. It's like, how, how, hi, how are you? Where are you from? Right? Like, exactly. Yeah. You got to like work that into the conversation uh, naturally, organically or something. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself like where you bring up your culture if that question is not asked? Like if you meet someone just normally and you're having a good time, yeah. you're not like, I am half Chinese and half I'm black. I'm not going to lie. Like, you are? I, for, I used to do that because I was like insecure and wanted validation. You know what I mean? I wanted to feel acceptance. By who though? Like people from, like, of, the, of your culture or just... From, yeah, from the Asian community because I don't look Asian to them. Oh, uh, okay. Now I don't care so much anymore. I'm just like, let me connect with all these people as a human. And then like, oh, do they like me as a human? And then it's like, why would I need validation for someone who doesn't see me as a human? That's true. So first, care about it's their like, opinion. the culture is not first. The humanity is first. And it's like, if, if, if organically that starts to happen or somebody else says that, it's like, oh, Ryan is also a Chinese. Then that's fine, but I don't need it for, for my sense of self worth, which like I used to need that on. That's good. That's and good. And I, I would go into these spaces, and this is really interesting. I would go into Asian spaces and feel like I didn't belong. So in order to feel like I belong, I would try to get the validation from that Asian space, and then I wouldn't feel the belonging. But it was because I was already projecting that sense of non belonging. Now, oh. if I go into a space, I'm just like, I just belong. And so I'm just going to talk to people like they're human. And if people like actually see me as a human, then we already connect. Yeah. Then, then it's just the icing on the cake that I'm also. Right. The fact that you're half Chinese you doesn't even saying? matter at that point, right? And I realized that it was me. It wasn't the community. And for the longest time, I thought it was the community. And, you know, my isolated experiences of racism that I had as a child were also we're, we're not helping because I was no. projecting that pain onto the community too when there are isolated incidents, right? They don't speak for the whole community. If I let them speak for the whole community, I am a racist. Like the racist people who are racist to me. Doing the same thing. So like I had to stop that cycle and a part of that stopping that cycle was almost like begging for validation, right? And so now I just go into spaces and I'm just kind and courteous and and then you start to see people for who they really are. And then, and then you make the decision. You know what I mean? Do I want to connect with these people or do I not want to? And you see the humanity of everybody. Because you start to see how people are conditioned, right? Without even knowing what I am. And them seeing me as a human, I'm like, I want to connect with that person. Me seeing them, like, oh, did they, oh, wait, they got kind of acting different now. They know I'm Chinese. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's like. Like they're kind of, they Reverse were mean at first, pushing. but now they're nice. You know, it's different if they just didn't know, and now now they find a stronger bond because I'm. Have you had that happen though, where you're, let's say, whether you're vibing okay with someone or not vibing at all, and suddenly yeah. when you be, when you tell them that you are half Chinese, then it's like a switch goes off with them. I think, uh, I think now that I don't really put that at the forefront, I'm just connecting with people. They'll just be like, "What?" They'll ask the question, 
why do you know so much about this culture? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh yeah. I'm. Um, I just happen to be. Yeah, I'm actually, I actually happen to be Chinese too. See, like this proves that you can be proudly of a culture, but not have to be obnoxiously screaming that you are of yes. that culture, right? All right, guys, we're on to our favorite part of the whole podcast this is ranting and raving, where normally Ben and I like to rant about something bad or uh, rave about something good happening in our lives. Most of the time, we're just bitching about just random stuff that's happening. But um, I have Ryan here today, so I would like yeah. to invite him onto this segment. Yeah, I'm going to uh, kick it off so you can kind of get what the vibe of this entire segment is. So yeah. recently, I posted something on social media with Ben where Ben made a mess in my house uh, during some filming that we were doing. And then I gave him like a... Re- Sorry, I gave him a paper towel. I wet it. I gave it to him. I said, okay, I'll, I'll grab another one. And he immediately stops me and says, what are you talking about? I have this one paper towel. He proceeds to wet the towel, rinse it, go back to the table, wipe with oh. it. And I stood there with the most amazed face. Not like shock, not like... I was just in disbelief that I went my entire life not realizing yeah. I could reuse a paper towel. <gasps> and I'm not privileged, by the way. So, I never did that either. So guys, don't come at me. Yeah. But when I posted... <laughs> that on social media, a lot of people did come at me. Really? In a very fun way. Like, okay. not, not very negative. Like, you know, okay. very fun. It's like, oh, Linji's privileged. What? Like, Linji's the 1%. He doesn't like, whatever, right? It just never crossed my mind to reuse a paper towel because they're called disposable paper towels for a yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah, So, and I made a poll about it. It was 51-49. Okay, exactly. It was such a exactly. split of people that- Who was the 51? 51 was people that just throw it out. Okay, cool. That just throw it out. But 49%. We're the majority. <laughs> we're the majority. <laughs> well, it's a very, very small majority. Yeah, I though. know. Still, though. So many people came at me, and I realized, like, guys, if 51% of people don't do it, that it's not that unnormal. It's, exactly. It's not a sign that I'm privileged. Exactly. It's not that I'm trying to destroy the environment because I had a lot of people saying I was destroying the environment. Yes. Okay? Yes. Destroy the destroying environment. Destroying the environment? What are you, what are you like a for- Fortune 500 company? Come on now. So I am going to try my best to reuse paper towels mm-hmm. because now that it's come to my uh, forefront that it is possible. Because sometimes like I will reuse a towel and just wipe something tiny off the table. In theory, I could just like rinse yeah. it off. And then or, save it for later. And save it for later. Or like sometimes when I have to dry my hands with a paper towel, if I don't have like a cloth towel anywhere, what I used to do is I'll take like the paper towel, I'll, I'll dry my hands and I'll immediately find something to clean. Mm. Like I'm just clean oh, yeah. like the same, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like yeah, oh, yeah. this like the microwave or something. Dude, I was just about to say the microwave door is exactly. a little bit dirty. Yeah, yeah. So you take that paper towel and just like wipe it. You do it. something on the counter, or something. Just something random. Yeah, because you have the too. paper towel anyway. So we're not as privileged as people think. Fine, fine. Okay, Here see, Brian agrees with me. It's not so so crazy though. Okay, there so guys, uh, get off my back. I know you're just teasing, so it's fun. But come on, there guys. we go. All right, Ryan, what do you have to rave about or to rant about this week? I. It's very relevant to what's happening right now. It's the the hip hop battle that's going on. Oh yes, with Drake K- and Kend- Kendrick yeah. and Drake and uh, kinda J Cole. Yeah, I don't like the flag that J Cole got for making a decision to back out and not go with like this tit for tat yeah. argument stuff. I think J Cole is like actually represents like the bigger man. He's being the bigger person, and I don't think he gets enough credit for yeah. it. But I'm also like we're talking about hip hop culture and hip hop fans. You know what I mean? They they're like boxing fans. They want to see the, the battle and the fight and they want to see someone get embarrassed and they want to take a side and they want to put money down. Right, because when it ends, it's yeah. no longer fun. There's no new entertainment. There's nothing. Uh, and that's what you see with a lot of like sports fans too. It's like, LeBron sucks. And it's like, LeBron sucks? LeBron is... He sucks? He's quantifiably the greatest of all time Yeah, at this but you're saying he sucks. That's insane to me. Also, to say that Kendrick sucks or to say that Drake sucks or J. Cole sucks, it's like, Really? They suck? You know, at this point, all Come these on. tracks back and forth, you could probably put them together and make like an entire album yeah. of it. Yes. And sell it. Dude. Do a tour, a, like a tour where they come together. I, so I kind of feel like this is performative. I was I just about feel to like say the same they thing. They got together and they're like, hey, let's do this thing. J. Cole, you want to do it? Yeah. like, yeah, I'll do uh, Actually, I don't want to do it. Okay, well, then it's just going to be me and, me and Kendrick and, or Drake and Kendrick. And we're just going to keep battling for, back and forth. And they'll think that someone's winning. And then we'll actually come together, make an like album of the disses. And then the, like, the, last, the last single will be like, hey, we mended it together. No black on black violence. Just kidding, guys. Like We're together. We're going to uplift the community together. 
All right. Uh, this is the outro, guys. Thanks for tuning in. If you miss Ben, Ben will be back next week. Um, it is currently four thirty right now, and he has not texted me, so he's he's probably still asleep. <laughs> ben, wake up. He's probably still asleep right now, which is fine. Which is fine. This makes it a little bit easier. Ryan was a- actually asking me how we would do a three person setup here anyway. Yeah. So this is our normal setup, which makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. I don't have to shift things around too much. But um, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on, Boo. It's been such a good conversation. If people want to stay up to date with what you're doing, where can they find you in all the interwebs? So just Ryan Alex H on every platform. I'll put that down in yeah. the in the box below as well. Is there anything uh, coming up that you want to plug? Is there anything else that you want to talk about recently? Uh, happy Asian Heritage Month or AAPI. A-P-I-H-N-H-I. We're not doing this because someone is less important. We're doing this because we both yeah. have bad memories. Okay, okay. That, yeah. that's all it is. That's all it is. Okay. Yeah, all that everyone considered in the Asian bracket. Yes, yes. How about that? It's going to be a busy ass month for both of us. You've yes. got a bunch of stuff that you're going around as well. So yeah. Uh, I'll get those frequent flyer miles or whatever it is. Yeah. And yeah. next time that you're back in Flushing, I'll take you out to uh, someplace that's not Let's Boba, okay? do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Take it easy. Bye.